shortly. So, um, hey guys, this is Finance Me Through Estate. So we have Yono Weiss here today. Uh, he's a cost segregation expert, um, business director at Madison uh, Specs for SPECS. Uh, so he will discuss the topic of cost segregation, what it means in the realm of real estate investing. So he's a real powerhouse with property owner stock savings. So he has helped uh, lots of clients to save uh, an aggregate of tens of millions of dollars on taxes through cost segregation. He has a background in teaching and a passion for real estate and helping others. He's a real estate investor as well. And he's the host of um, um, the podcast called Wise Advice. Um, so um, as you guys know, we do, it's a, it's a real pleasure to have him here. As you guys know, we do uh, weekly live webinars every Tuesday. Um, with Q and A at the end, so if you guys have any questions, feel free to relate um, at the end of our um, conversation, or put them on the chat, and I will relate, relate them over for you. So with that, I'm gonna pass it on to Yona, and uh, yeah, thanks, Yona, for being here. Appreciate it, Stefana. Appreciate you having me. Great to be here. Looks like a, a very lively crowd tonight. Um, see some, recognize a few people. Charles, Oleg. Few uh, other people from bigger pockets and, and around the other uh, social media places where we may have bumped into each other. So I appreciate you guys coming to this and happy to have me joining and you know talking a little bit about cost segregation tonight. It's a it's a great topic. Some of you may have a, a little bit of an idea about it. Some of you may have more of an idea. Uh, my goal tonight is to try to give a general overview of what the subject entails, as well as go into some more uh, deep and maybe complicated questions that may arise and hopefully clear up all of that as well. Um, so without further ado, Stefan, what do you think I should share a PowerPoint just kind of go through? Do you want to do a Q&A? Like what uh, you want me to just kind of give it up, over? Up to you really. Yeah, we can we can have more conversation. That's fine as well. You, you don't need to do a PowerPoint up to you, Yona, however you like. Okay, so I'd love uh, just to get a little engagement from our, from our, uh, you know, participants tonight, everyone that's here, if you wouldn't mind opening your chat box, if you guys are watching this and are listening in, and just go ahead and open that chat box. I'd just love to hear what your familiarity is with cost segregation up till this point. So I'd love you to write the number one, two, three, or four. And what I want you to do is number one, if this is the first time you've ever heard of cost segregation, you saw this, you come to Stefan's meetup, you're like, okay, I come every week. This is an interesting topic. Number one, hey, you guys put two. I didn't even say what it was. Uh, but two is going to be, if you've heard of it, and you maybe understand a little bit, but but don't know the great detail, that's going to be number two. So you guys are writing the numbers before I even uh, recognize that. Number three is going to, you can feel free to write again. Number three is going to be, um, if you're very, very familiar, in fact, you've already used conservation on your own properties, and it's something that you're very, very familiar with, but would love to learn some more uh, you know, deeper aspects of it. And number four is, if you are really the cost seg king expert, I will give you my crown and you'll give the presentation. So feel free to put one, two, three, or four. We have a few people wrote over here. So great to see. Um, Charles, yeah, I think you're like, you're 3.5. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> uh, you could probably give this talk. Um, but it's it's great to see. Okay, so a couple of people, you've heard about it. You know what it is. You've heard the name. Don't really understand it so well. Um, so I'd love to just kind of break it down. And depreciation I think you know what I think I will I will share a uh, I will share a PowerPoint because why not you don't want to just look at look at me the whole time uh, but if you guys do have questions feel free to write them in the chat and I'm happy to uh, to answer them so let's just share the screen over here I got a, a PowerPoint that I like to call the magical world of cost segregation and the reason why I do that is because cost segregation is magic. It doesn't really make sense. I mean, honestly, there is no real explanation to this besides the fact that it's literally magic. And I'll explain to you why I feel that way. Um, but essentially, cost segregation, uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit, I'll tell you what I'm gonna talk about tonight. We'll do a little case study at the end, but basically I'm gonna run overview between depreciation and cost segregation because cost seg, as I like to call it, is really just an advanced form of depreciation. And we'll go through the benefits, who should be doing this, 
uh, who should not be doing this, uh, when would be the best time, what's bonus depreciation, and um, you know what, what's a real estate professional? This is a topic, and a lot of these topics, I mean, I get tagged on uh, on bigger pockets, you know, almost every day these questions come up and people uh, talk about these things. And there's a lot of people who don't understand this. And I'm glad that you guys took the time out this evening to to join us to understand a little more about this, because I think it is probably, you know, when you talk about real estate investing, usually it's thrown around. And, and I, obviously you see these social media graphics, and I'm sure you've seen, you know, these blog posts that if they're, you know, comparing real estate to stock market or other investments, et cetera. And there's always like the boxes checked, right? So there's equity, there's appreciation, there's, you know, uh, and the tax benefits and all, all the time, real estate, the tax benefits box is checked up, right? But what are the tax benefits, right? Does, does anyone know what some of the tax benefits of real estate are? Um, because I'd love for you to put in the chat, what are some tax, obviously depreciation, and constantly what we're going to talk about tonight, that's the biggest one by far. And, and I feel like it gets overlooked a lot because a lot of people don't really understand it. And because it requires a engineering component to it, as opposed to most every other tax benefit out there is, is simply a tax write-off or a tax this or that. Since this can, uh, can requires an engineering component to it, there are uh, it's much more complicated and a lot of accountants don't even know about it or can't do it. And so therefore it gets overlooked quite a bit. So this is why I feel so necessary to talk about this topic and understand this, right? So you guys uh, put in the chat over here, some other great real estate tax benefits, the capital gain, right? Of course, the 1031 exchanges, DSTs, which can be, uh, there's two different translations of DST, uh, but either one of those are, are great ways to defer capital gains real estate professional, passive loss offsetting. Yeah, we're going to talk about that, the real estate professional side, because I think that's one of the biggest things as well. Um, but cost segregation, depreciation is by far the biggest tax benefit that's out there. Essentially, if you don't know what this is, and I apologize to, to Charles for, you know, if I'm going to bore you tonight, but we're entertaining. That's what we're here for. So I'm going to throw, throw in some cost seg jokes in there. If you've heard them before, you know, feel free to laugh uh, just for my benefit. But Cost seg, and again, it's a weird name, but essentially it is a way to depreciate your property. Anytime you buy a property, whether it's a residential, a commercial, as long as it's not your personal residence, you business property, investment property, you get to take a tax deduction called depreciation. Okay. This is not a, uh, it's not intrinsic to the actual depreciation, the devaluation, or you know, if a property is going down, that's not what it means. That's not what we're talking about. So don't get confused by the name. Okay, the name is just a borrowed term. It's a tax deduction called depreciation based on the concept that things go down in value as time goes on. But essentially, what you're doing is taking a brand, a property that you bought, okay, and it may be a very old property, and you now get to start taking the total value that you paid for it, okay? You buy a property for a million dollars. We'll give an example shortly. You now get to take that million dollars, subtract a little bit for land, and then take it as a tax write-off. Literally deduct that million dollars from your income tax, okay? Not all at once. Don't get too excited. Over a 39-year period, if it's a commercial property or 27 and a half if it's a residential property. These are kind of arbitrary numbers. Still not sure why, right? Commercial properties um, last longer. I'm not sure. Uh, however, it's it's not intrinsic, and I want you to remember this. It's not intrinsic to the property. It's simply a borrowed term. So when you go buy this property for a million dollars and then go sell it to your friend for five million, five years later, that friend gets to start his 27 and a half years from the day they buy it based on the five million. I mean, now you were writing off a million dollars divided by 27, right? About 30,000 a year. Now your friend gets to write off five million dollars for 27 years. Okay, as an income tax write-off. So again, it's not intrinsic to the property. This is just a borrowed term. But 27 and a half or 39 years, as arbitrary as they are, there's still long periods of time. Okay, um, I'm older than that. Or you can see from the gray hairs, et cetera. But some of us can't imagine, I'm going to hold, hold a property, own a property for 39 years. No, most of us won't. And, and with real estate transactions, sure, there are people who hold you know, indefinitely properties. But a lot of times people are buying, selling, and so you may not ever be able to benefit from those depreciation deductions. There's a tax planning strategy which allows you to front load or, 
let, let's put it in a different way. We're reclassing, we're segregating the cost. Okay, that's the name. We're, we're breaking down the cost of the building or the property into different categories that depreciate on different schedules. And once you do that, you can take those deductions of those items at a faster rate. Okay, so essentially that's what we're doing. It's cost range, we're segregating the cost into different categories, allowing you to take bigger tax write-offs um, you know, first. So as Charles mentioned the that passive losses when you sell, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna get into that as well. The big, big uh, you know, benefits when we're, when we're talking about cost segregation and the passive losses that come along with that. So let's just give a quick example here. I mentioned if you bought a property for a million dollars, you always have to subtract a certain amount for land. Land does not depreciate. So let's say 15%, that's a pretty average amount. Um, it's gonna depend on the type of property, the size of the property, the location of the property, right? Certain places in the country like California is very notorious for having very high uh, land values, which, you know, they may put it like 50% instead of 15%. But whatever that land value is, that's going to lower your depreciable basis, the cost, the amount that you can totally deduct over that period of time. So if it's a straight line depreciation, which every accountant in the world knows what straight line depreciation is, meaning take that basis, and then divide it by 39 or 27 and a half. And that's gonna be your tax deduction every single year. Okay, so for commercial property, million dollars, and this is gonna be per million also. Okay, so it's a five million, just multiply that by five, um, et cetera, to 21,000, right, and change. That's gonna be your deduction each year. For a residential, including multifamily, is considered residential for this, uh, for tax purposes, even though, you know, for lending purposes, over four units is considered commercial, has nothing to do with, uh, this for the tax purposes, residential is still considered multifamily and 30,909. So essentially, if you're making a net operating income, okay, let's say you're making um, $60,000, okay, pretty, pretty nice uh, net income for your property, you bought for a million bucks, and you're making $60,000, guess what, you get to immediately deduct 21,000 or 30,000 respectively, from that income, and you're only going to be taxed on the remainder uh, and that's what's called depreciation deduction. Okay, so you're only taxed on the remainder. You're still going to be taxed on thirty thousand instead of sixty thousand, or instead of you know, or forty thousand instead of sixty thousand. However, you're reducing that. That's the tax benefit of depreciation. However, with cost segregation, we're able to take larger deductions in the earlier years, right? We're front loading a certain portion of that, and we'll get into the exact examples of what those things are in a second to the point where you can literally over the first five years, typically um, pay zero taxes. How does that happen? Because we're front loading, let's say 25%, 25% of $850,000, that's close to $200,000, right? Front load that to the first five years, that's giving you an additional, right? 20, $25,000 a year of depreciation deductions. Okay, that is reducing your tax, your net income, right? Almost entirely to zero. There still may be a little bit there. However, that's literally going to be wiping out your tax bill almost entirely, if not entirely. And there is a tax, another great thing we'll get to we'll call bonus depreciation, which literally allows you to front load that. And I'm not going to get ahead of myself, but I will get to that shortly. So that's essentially how depreciation works and how cost segregation can literally put that on steroids, so to speak, and front load a huge chunk of that. And feel free if I'm talking too fast or you have any questions, please do put them in the chat. Uh, that's what we're here for, to learn together and to make sure that we're all on the same page. So just to recap how this works, it is an engineering study, okay? That the engineer who's trained in the tax code and engineering, construction engineering, coming to the property and identifying every individual component um, in that property and depreciating it on a different category, a different schedule, allowing you to create bigger tax deductions in the earlier years. So what are those things that we're talking about, all these things in different schedules? Essentially, when we're talking about real estate, we're talking about four different categories, four different asset classes. I have two here on the page, but I'll talk about the first two that are not on the page. Land, we already discussed. Land is the first category. It does not depreciate. The second category is building, structure. That's the only thing that depreciates on that 27 half, 39 year schedule. However, and, and even though in a multifamily property or a commercial property, typically speaking, the structure is gonna be the majority of the value of any property, okay? You're talking about the roof, the walls, the doors, windows, floor, um, you know, anything that is infrastructure or structural is gonna be considered the value is in there. However, there's so many things that are considered the two other categories here of five-year personal property, 
which again, it's not necessarily personal, tangible things that are non-structural in the interior of the building. And that can be anything, as you can see here, like millwork, mirrors, carpeting, right? Even building mounted flood lighting, okay? Cable TV, cabinetry. These are different categories taken from a multifamily property, decorative lighting, moldings, even stuff like carpeting, equipment, furniture, appliances. All those things are movable, you understand it, but carpeting, cabinets, countertops, these things are considered five-year property, meaning you can take the value of those individual items that our engineer is identifying, how much, how many cabinets are here? What's the square footage? What's the square footage of the carpeting? What's the value of those? And then taking that as a tax write-off on a five-year schedule. Same too with the second category, 15-year land improvements, anything that's on top of land. So land does not depreciate, but anything on top of it is considered land improvements depreciates on a 15-year schedule, meaning landscaping, asphalt, concrete, right? Anything outside, pavement markings, right? Playground equipment, pool, retaining wall. You see all these different things, signage. All that has value <clears throat> and identifying what the value of these individual components are. And I keep calling it components. It actually used to be called, cost segregation used to be called component depreciation, right? Which makes a lot more sense, right? And people understand, okay, component depreciation. I'm, I'm depreciating the components individually on their own respective schedules. Then you say cost segregation, what? What's that? It's just the same thing. We're breaking down that cost and putting things in different buckets, so to speak, different categories, and then taking those depreciation deductions at a faster rate. And like I said, typically it can be a tremendous amount. Um, just to give you an example, uh, before we get to those examples, I'll just recap here for those I see a couple people joined <clears throat> a little bit after, some people came, some people left. But those of you who are watching, you're just joining in the middle, what we're doing here is we're reducing our tax liability. We're not creating deductions out of thin air. And I want to make this very clear. We're not creating deductions out of thin air. What we're doing is front loading a certain portion of those deductions that instead of waiting 39 years, <clears throat> excuse me, just taking a little bit each year, you can take advantage of that overall like pool of potential deductions and take advantage of them now, this year, over the next five years. What, do, what does that do? That increases your cash flow because you don't have to pay taxes on that money. That money can be reinvested. Not only is that the time value of money, I mean, right now with the inflation, the way it's going, right? You're losing money. Take advantage, take that money now. You can reinvest that. And that's the power of compound interest. That's the power of, you know, hedging inflation, et cetera. So this is why conservation is so important, especially in our day and age, when we have this uh, rule called bonus depreciation, which we're going to get to. And even without that, the benefits of using your money or using those potential deductions to create passive losses and reduce your taxable income. So as you can see from this, uh, well, yes, if I may interject. So on the previous slide, so like, I just want to delve a little bit into that part. So it's this one. Yes. Yeah, so it's like about 20% of, let's say the asset value of, uh, you know, like assets being uh, cost segregated versus not is like sort of broadly speaking around across properties um, that the actual cash tax savings uh, deduction that, um, that you've seen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, the, it's going to depend from property to property, yeah, of course, mm -hmm. and it's going to depend uh, from person to person because there's a difference between the deductions you get and what that means on an after-tax basis to the individual. Okay, so if I have a hundred thousand dollars of income and I have a uh, hundred thousand dollars of deductions, okay, which will reduce my taxable income to zero in that scenario, and my tax rate, okay, is 25%, let's just say, uh, I know that's not right, but just to keep it simple, then I would be literally saving, right, $25,000 that I don't have to pay. So that's net cash savings in my pocket from that $100,000 deductions. Now, obviously, it's going to be different if you have a 39% a or a 43% tax rate. Obviously, the savings are much greater at that point. Got it. <clears throat> and uh, so, yeah, I mean, this chart is kind of old chart. I don't know why I still have this in here from a couple of years ago. But essentially, you can see a 39, right, $3.9 million office moving pretty simple. You have a $100,000 deduction each year. That's called straight line depreciation. Instead of that, you front load, you know, 20, 25% of that to the first year. And uh, for excuse me, a few years, you get a big spike in the first year. And then it kind of goes down and down and down until year seven, where you have still, right, you're taking depreciation deductions, just 25% less. So I want to make this clear. We're not taking all your depreciation up front. We're just taking a portion of it. And then the years after that, you will still have, uh, you know, relatively 
less depreciation deductions as you go on. So what's bonus depreciation? Anyone heard of this before? Who knows what bonus depreciation is? Put a yes in the, in the, in the chat box if you ever heard of bonus depreciation before, you know what this is. Uh, I would love to hear your, you put a no also if you've never heard of this because this is, uh, kind of gets, yes, so Jeff's heard of it, Charles heard of it. Uh, bonus depreciation, Stefan's heard of it. It's a tax benefit, right? Once you've done a cost segregation study and you identify what those things are that depreciate on a five-year schedule, right? Everyone loves a bonus, right? Oh, like, yeah, everyone loves a bonus. Let's do it. Let's get the bonus while we can. Uh, once you've done the cost seg and you put these assets on faster depreciation schedules, you now, according to the, the law that was passed in the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, you can now take 100% of those accelerated depreciation deductions at a faster rate. How fast? In the first year, right? It used to be 50%, right, for a short period of time, but it's now 100%, which means anything under 10, 20 years, which is all the things we are identifying with the cost segregation, you can now take that all up front. So remember our example, we had you know, a million dollar property, $850,000, your normal depreciation would have been like 30,000 a year. And you do cost creation, get an extra 200,000 over those first five years. Guess what? You can take that all up front in the first year, meaning a $200,000 tax deduction. Now that's pretty great, especially considering a million dollar property, you may have only had to put down a down payment of 20%, $200,000 and you can get literally 100% of that back um, as a tax right in the form of a tax write-off albeit in that first year. Okay, so this is the power of bonus depreciation. It's set in the books as of now to start phasing out in 2023. So it's gonna start going down to 80% and then 60, 20% each year until 2028. Well, there will no longer be, according to the law currently, any more bonus depreciation. However, the bonus, it's not extra. I just wanna make this clear. It's not a bonus, not an extra on top of that. It's just allowing you to front load the entire amount of those extra, of those accelerated deductions in the first year, okay? And this is huge. I mean, literally people um, paying zero taxes from this strategy uh, over the past few years. You know, just a quick question. So so for bonus dep depreciation, so the, this front holding within the first one or two years, so is that only allowed for cost segregation or are there other kind of um, tax strategies that could lead to bonus depreciation? Yeah, the bonus depreciation is specifically with cost segregation, meaning once you have done a cost segregation study and identified what those items are that depreciate faster, like I mentioned, the five-year, the 15-year personal property, land improvements, now you can have the option to take that in the first year as a tax write-off, okay? So that's called the bonus depreciation. There are other types of deductions out there, like a 179 deduction, which is similar um, it's for equipment purchases and things like that. You can take as a write-off in the first year, 100% of that. There are limitations to that, however, like a million dollar limitation. There's no limitation to, to bonus depreciation. Uh, so there are, you know, this is really a unique scenario with the bonus depreciation. Um, there are, I guess, maybe there are certain deductions, maybe like a, a car, if you have a car for a business or things like that, there are other types of deductions. But when it comes to real estate, this is specifically um, once you've done a conservation study. Yeah, thanks. Excellent for question. Work. Yeah, awesome. Um, so, who should be doing this? Really, anyone who is tax liable. And, and there are a couple, uh, and so really any type of entity or any type of uh, ownership that that buys a property can benefit from cost segregation. I'll give a couple examples that maybe you may not have thought about. Okay, if you're buying a property as an individual or a partnership LLC, whatever it is, it's pretty straightforward, right? You, according to your percentage of ownership, or if you're an investor, a private, uh, excuse me, a passive investor in a syndication, which is very common, you will get depreciation deductions according to your percentage of ownership, your equity ownership. So if you're putting in $100,000 right into this syndication, and you, you know, because of that, you're getting like a three percent, you know, uh, equity stake in the whole property, and you know, the bonus depreciation is $10 million, whatever that is, you're going to get in that first year, right? Three percent of that. That's you know. Uh, $300,000, right? So you're going to get a big amount. You're, you put in $100,000. Does that make sense? That doesn't make sense. $300,000, um, 3%. Anyways, whatever, that was probably uh, a bad example. I didn't run through the numbers in my head before I spoke. So we're, the, the point of the matter is that you'll get your percentage of ownership, okay? Um, however, there's a couple 
instances where if you're not a taxpayer or for example, you're a nonprofit or you're investing for a nonprofit. I just had a client last week who told me about, he had an investor, uh, you know, this was a syndicator and he got a large investment from an endowment. Okay. This was from a, uh, a university or some sort of institution, a uh, university or something like that, where they had an endowment, but it was a nonprofit. Okay. So that nonprofit entity cannot benefit from the depreciation. Similarly, a retirement account, uh, 401k, self-directed 401k, they call it QRPs, qualified retirement, uh, uh, what's it called? Qualified retirement program. Blanked on that for a second. Anyways, um, those as well as a Roth IRA are tax shelters, in which case you will not benefit from depreciation. So the concentration makes no sense to do in those scenarios. Um, so yeah, Charles just mentioned that as passing 75 to 100% of the investment, you will get back in the first year's bonus depreciation. So a better example of that would be, right, maybe I'll break that down in, in, a, in a short while when we get to the case study. But one case where you may not even consider it, I mentioned at the beginning, any type of property besides your personal residence can benefit from this. So what about a case where you're a business owner and you own a business, your corporation, whatever it is, and the business buys a property? Uh, let's say you're a doctor and you have an office. An office owner. You don't consider yourself a real estate owner or investor. You just happen to buy the office and you're working out of that office building. Or you, you have a, a manufacturing company or something. You have a space where you bought that factory or what have you. All these cases, right? Or you're a restaurant and you bought the property. All these cases, right? You wouldn't consider yourself, or that person may not consider themselves a real estate investor. However, they do get the benefits of depreciation and can do a cost segregation. And not only that, it can be used to offset the business income since the business owns that. Different from just an LLC, an individual, an LLC buying a property as specifically an investment and not a business property, and we'll see shortly that it's going to be treated differently in terms of the tax um, benefits, meaning the amount that you can actually deduct against your business income as opposed to um, the passive income, the rental income. Okay, because depreciation, excuse me, real estate is considered rental income, passive income. However, if it's a business operating out of it, it's a business income, very different. Okay, so that's uh, something to keep in mind. So we talked about how much, right? Stefan asked, how much can we can we depreciate? And so here's some examples, you know, real life examples of the average reallocation. Uh, well, once we do a cost segregation, meaning we're taking that tax basis, how much is going to building structural, and then how much is going reallocated to these faster lives that you can take bonus depreciation on. So apartments, multifamily, typically it's around on average about 27% or so. So anywhere between 20 and 30% is what we're seeing. Definitely certain cases where it can be more than that. Um, even cases where it's less than that, it will depend on a lot of factors. Uh, again, we look at every single property individually. However, we always run a free estimate if anyone wants uh, to see what their property that they own or they're looking to buy, what the potential benefits might be. We'll run a free analysis so you can see the potential tax savings of that. But you can see all types of property. And you can do this on any type of property whatsoever. Uh, some have much more depreciation. Manufacturing has a lot of equipment and things like that. Hotels, much more furniture and fixtures, et cetera. And all the way to the bottom here, warehouses and very little. Okay. You may have the land improvements. You have parking. Um, you may have parking structure, parking lots, excuse me, pavement there, but interior of a warehouse is pretty empty. So there's not going to be a lot there. Mobile home parks, MHPs off the charts. We're seeing on average 50 to 80% reallocation of mobile home parks. Um, so that's really off the chart. So, so Charles asks, does this graph have leverage? And I assume what you're asking is, is this taking into consideration leverage on the property? Um, it's not because depreciation is based on your purchase price, regardless if you have leverage or not. Meaning if the bank paid for 80% of the property, you still get to take 100% of those depreciation deductions. Even if you have seller financing and you literally paid $0 on your property, you still, if the transaction happened, you are now the owner you now get to take 100% of the depreciation, okay? Which means it's not dependent, which also means the more um, cash you have in a deal, the less um, proportionate depreciation you will have in the deal. Excuse me, one moment. So I guess you wanna... Uh, mm -hmm. Apologize. We had our maintenance person who didn't realize I was 
in this room here and uh, I thought he double booked it or something like that. Anyways, pretty different conference. That's what happens when you're traveling. Just a question, no problem. Yeah. Just a question. So I guess what uh, Charles is um, uh, alluding to or saying is, okay, so with, uh, with considering leverage and then like for a passive investor or um, or even the sponsor, like putting in his own funds in the deal, you know, plus the leverage, it ends up like what Charles put on the chat that he has experienced as a passive seeing like 75% to 100% of his original investment being returned uh, with yeah. depreciation. Yeah, that's usually... Uh, going to be only when you have a large amount of leverage, right? If you're doing, you know, in typical syndications, et cetera, that are taking on, you know, 75, 80% uh, loan to value. Because like I mentioned, the more cash you have in a deal, the less proportionate depreciation you will have, okay? So if you have, you buy something all cash for a million dollars, right? You're going to get a million dollars of depreciation, right? Over that course of ownership. But 20% of that, let's say, is going to be your bonus depreciation. That means you're only going to get a 20%, so to speak, return on your cash investment. However, if only 20% of the equity was cash and the bank paid for the rest, you'll still get the $200,000 of bonus depreciation. And that will cover the entire $200,000 of cash investment. Okay, uh, uh, from that, and so that's where you're seeing the 75 to 100 percent of that uh, leverage of the investment. Okay, so just to to be clear on that, the the other thing we want to say here is, you know, it really does depend. Each property is unique. This is just an average, and this is, you know, uh, certain cases will be more, certain cases will be less, and that's why I always recommend, right, get a free analysis. If you have a property you're interested in this, you can see what your individual property uh, can look like. So now I want to get into the real estate professional, right? Charles mentioned this at the beginning and, and Stefan also. This is one of the greatest tax benefits that exists. It's called the real estate professional status. You may have heard this before. Reps, you kind of see it around REPS, real estate professional status. Gets talked about, gets thrown around a lot. It is something where on your tax return, where it asks for your occupation and you write real estate professional, you automatically get this magic like golden uh, ticket, right? <laughs> you get this app, this thing that allows you, as we'll see shortly, to use passive deductions to offset active ordinary income, which is not the case for anyone else. So let me take a step back before we define what a real estate professional is and just describe what depreciation is and how it helps with your retail income, right? Because in the beginning, we're talking about you made $100,000 and you have $100,000 deductions, right? You get to knock it off. What happens if you have you know, $100,000 of income, but $200,000 of passive of, of depreciation deductions, what happens to that extra $100,000? Okay, that's what we're going to talk about right now. Rental income from any real estate is considered passive income, even though it may not be very passive, especially if you're, you know, an active investor. It's, however, from the IRS's perspective, it's called passive income. Depreciation is considered a passive deduction. Okay, so that's going to go to offset your passive income. So if you make from your property and any rental income you have, so if you own 20 properties, all that's going to be lumped together, all the income is going to be lumped together and any depreciation you have, right, from any of your properties is going to be lumped together and are going to go one against the other. Okay, one to one, you know, one bucket to offset the other bucket, so to speak, one column to offset the other column. And if you get to zero, then you have no tax liability from that. However, in our example, you did bonus depreciation, you get this whole $100,000 of extra deductions that creates what's called a passive loss, okay? Because again, it's passive deductions. You have a passive loss. If you're not a real estate professional, anyone, right, who just invests in real estate or you have W-2 and you, just, you own, a, you know, a, a rental or whatever, what have you, that extra passive loss cannot be used in the same tax year against any ordinary, any W-2 income or anything like that it gets carried forward, which means you can use it next year. It doesn't go away, it doesn't disappear. You can use it in the future until you sell the property or until that is used up, whichever comes first, okay? The, the only case, right? Or there's a couple other exceptions, but we'll talk about this, you know, the majority case here, which is called the real estate professional status, okay? When you are real estate professional, you or your spouse, you now have no limitations. Okay, it's called passive loss limitations. You have no limitations on how much of that passive income, passive losses, excuse me, you can use against any income, your income, ordinary income, not just the passive, not just the rental income, ordinary income, active income, your spouse's W-2 income, 
et cetera. Okay, so let's define this now and we'll see how awesome this can be. And this is something that is decided on a year by year basis. Okay, your tax return that year, if you were a real estate professional, you now have this, um, this golden ticket. However, it's defined as follows. This is from the IRS publication, so you can look it up there. Um, you qualify if you or your spouse, only one of you needs this qualification in order to get this uh, benefit. More than half of your personal services in that year are materially participating in the real estate trader business, okay? So more than half your time literally means more than 50% of your working hours of the year. However, practically, it means you cannot have another job, okay? You cannot have a W-2 job, even though in, you know, in the letter of the law here, it, it seems like, oh, well, if I own, you know, 20 properties and I'm self-managing them, even though I have a W-2 job and working 40 hours a week, I can still have more than 40 hours a week of spending my property. I can get, you know, this real estate professional status. The IRS has said in every single, right, without exception, every single time where someone has tried to claim that in a tax court, they have lost. Okay. So it's not something, you know, practically, you know, literally, it may be something you can do, practically cannot happen. So you need to be full-time in real estate, or if you have a W-2, it might have to be, you know, something that's just, uh, you know, maybe a, a very, you know, light job or something like that, you know, I, uh, for example, someone who's just working, you know, 10, 15, 20 hours a week, then, you know, that may be the case. You may be able to, to claim that as well. But you need to perform more than 7 or 50 hours a year of this material participation, which is not too difficult to do. About 16 hours a week means you are actually working in real estate. You're actually managing properties. You're actually doing stuff. You're not just, you know, totally retired, sitting on a beach, doing whatever you want. Uh, you can't do that. In order to get real estate, you actually, professional status, you got to actually be still working in that trader business during that tax year. So in this column here, we, the IRS describes, what does it mean a real estate professional? Does it mean I work for a mortgage broker? Does it mean I work for a private equity company that buys real estate? No, unfortunately, you actually have to be material participating and owning real estate, um, developing, redeveloping, constructing, reconstructing, acquiring, converting, renting, leasing, operating, managing, or brokering. Brokering is the one case where you, you know, have this benefit. If you're a real estate broker, that's what you're doing all day. Guess what? You get this tax benefit. So I tell every single person who is a real estate broker, you're already spending the time, make sure you own real estate as well. You invest in long-term rentals or uh, et cetera, commercial properties, whatever it is, in order to take advantage of the depreciation to offset your W-2 or your, you know, your uh, active broker income. Okay, if you're a good broker and you're making commission, all that's being taxed at the highest possible tax rate. If you are a wholesaler, fix and flipper, right? Doing any of these things where you're actively in real estate, but all those are transactional, all that money is going to be taxed at the highest tax rate. Make sure you're also investing in rentals so that you can get that depreciation and help to offset those, uh, you know, that active income as well. So I see in the chat over here, right, Charles, right? Uh, oh, sorry, it was direct to me. Uh, I'm not sure if you meant to do that, but let me, let me get to that at the end. Um, we'll get to that later. So let's move right along here. When should you be doing a cost? And there, I did say there is one exception to that. Maybe we'll get to that at a different time. But if you're making less than $100,000 of adjusted gross income, then you can actually claim up to $25,000 of those losses against your W-2. That's the one exception. It's not that common. Uh, maybe it is common, but it's less common. So I you know, just want to stick with the, the main topics here. So when should you be doing this? Can it be done? Anytime you want, yes. The answer is yes, because this is a tax strategy. It's really up to you. Use it when it's most beneficial to you. If let's say you buy a property and it, you're totally doing renovations and you have zero income from that property, it's not going to help you necessarily to get these big extra deduction passive loss if you don't even have income to offset it. So use it when it's beneficial. Uh, I know many people who, you know, they maybe have a lot of losses. You know, they have a lot of real estate and have a lot of losses. So on a new acquisition, they may not need the cost segregation necessarily, but maybe a year, two, three years down the road where they're going to have a big taxable event, right? A big capital gain on a sale or something like that. That's the time when they want to get this big deduction and use the cost segregation at that point. So again, it is a strategy. It's something that can be done at any point. You do not have to amend your tax returns in order to do this retroactively on a property owned in a previous tax year. This is called a look back study. Uh, it's a pretty simple process. And so that's something really you can take advantage of on a property you've owned for a number of years. You can go back and get it done. But 
Many people, most people, I should say, reach out to me uh, or us as soon as they buy a property or even when they're under contract. They want to see, I'm under contract here, how much depreciation, how much my tax benefit's going to be if I do this. Uh, however, you know, get it done once you close in the property, get it done the first year, set it up the right way from the beginning. The only time you are going to change the amount of depreciation you could take is when you add more money into the property. Remember, at the beginning, I told you it's like arbitrary. It's, you know, it's not intrinsic to the property. Cost segregation, the depreciation deduction is set on the price that you paid for it, right? You paid for a million dollars for a property. You, your basis, your tax basis is based on that million dollars. It doesn't go up if you refinance. Let's say you get an appraisal and it goes up in value. Sorry, does not change your depreciation. The only time your depreciation amount is going to change is when you put more money, capital improvements into that property. So you can do an extra conservation study on those capital improvements, on the CapEx, on the renovations uh, as well. It can be done for new construction. So many different options here of when you can be doing it. So let's just run into this uh, quick case study over here. And I think we're gonna kind of round it out after this and make sure you put some questions if you do have any. Um, yes, so multifamily property bought for 32, uh, excuse me, 32 unit property in North Carolina, 1.75 million. This was the first multifamily purchase after many single family rentals. Why is this important, many single family rentals? Because this guy actually tried to do what's called a 1031 exchange, which allows you to sell property by exchanging it for another property and not even pay capital gains tax on that sale because you did it through these, you know, hoops and you jump through and whatever you did, sign these forms and fill the stuff. And he wasn't able to do it. There's certain time limitations. You have to find properties within 45 days. You have to close on it within 180 days. He wasn't able to do it. He had a bunch of single families, I think like 20 or something. He sold and made a lot of money on the sale and was looking at a capital gains bill of around $300,000. Okay. So what did he do? We did a cost segregation, and that's important because I want to share with you that cost segregation can be used not just to offset income, as we spoke about before, but also to offset passive gains, right, from all the real estate sale. So that's why this is so important, a part of the story here. So without cost segregation, he would have had 54000 in change of depreciation each year. Remember, you're taking that purchase price, taking off for land, dividing that by 27 and a half. That's going to be your 54000 However, he was making about $120,000, $130,000 of operating income on this property. That meant he was still going to be hit with a tax bill, right? Being taxed on about $70,000, going to be hit with a tax bill of, you know, roughly $20,000, $30,000. So you want to see what can I do to offset that? What do we do? Cost segregation, we found approximately 20% into five year property, 8% to 15 year property. Again, the main structural component is 72 percent. If you're just joining now, the five-year, that's all the personal property stuff that's non-structural. 15-year, that's land improvements, pavement, landscaping, etc. cetera. Um, and so we're able to get for this guy an extra $421,000. So that offset his income entirely from the property. And in that year, offset that capital gains bill of $300,000 that he would have had to pay. So it's really important to understand that cost segregation is a tax strategy. And if used right, it can help you in many different scenarios, not just from income, also from sales, from gains, uh, from passive uh, gains, et cetera. So moving right along, I think that pretty much wraps it up here. Um, what you look for in a cost of study, this is taken directly from the tax codes. You can go to IRS's website and check out the cost of audit techniques guide over here. And especially with insomnia, I highly recommend you checking this out. It will certainly help you. It's helped me several times. Um, there's a whole methodology that goes into this. It's not something you can just do on the back of a napkin. It's not something you can do to, you know, just figure out, oh, 8%, 20%, let's just take a $400,000 tax deduction. No problem. No, you actually need to show your work. So that's what a cosmetic study does. It has a whole numbering system, a whole nomenclature. It's about an 80, 90 page report that we produce that has, you know, everything the IRS is looking for. Um, and so, you got to sh show case, you know, court history. You got to show, you know, all the tax codes and the listings, identification numbers of every individual component, et cetera, et cetera. And I don't want to bore you too much with that stuff, but just to tell you that it does require uh, expertise. It's not something that can just be done.
by anyone. Um, just a little bit on our company, we've done over 13,000 studies, um, over 3 billion in tax savings, and we keep going and going. So happy to help. If, uh, oh, this is my disclaimer. If you have, this is not tax advice. Remember, ask your accountant or your tax advisor and uh, just informational, that's all. So I should have probably done this at the beginning, but we put it in there anyways at the end. So you can feel free to reach out to me. Find me on LinkedIn. If you haven't already, please connect with me on LinkedIn. That's where I'm most active. You can also go to yonaweiss.com. That's my website, madisonspecs.com. That's my company's website. And um, that's it. That's all I got. All right. Okay. So uh, that was great. Let so me <laughs> start with a question myself. So, so suppose like, you know, like one of the things I'm sure many people are wondering, so you have like somebody like, you know, like the way people say about Trump taxes or something, you have a real estate professional, right? Let's yeah. say a real estate professional who has, a, you know, let's say he has a hundred million dollars in assets. And he's yeah. uh, investing in, let's say he's purchasing $20 million per year in, uh, in new properties. Yeah. He, um, I'm listening, I'm just trying to plug in my laptop for you guys. He's receiving yeah. acquisition fee of 2% on each of those. Yeah. He ends up with a tax bill of zero, right? So, mm -hmm. so would you say that's, um, you know, so cost segregation is the main kind of um, culprit for that, you know, like positive, positive culprit in the sense of, would you say if the same, um, you know, real estate professional investment manager in this case, he's not actually cost segregating his new purchases, he would end up with a tax bill just on the basis of pure depreciation and the rest of the uh, real estate tax benefits. But with cost segregation, being able to bonus depreciate afterwards, you know, really accelerate things. Yeah. Uh, that's what- Yeah, for sure. Because, you know, if you think about it, like you have like a significant, a significant, significant acquisition fees that you receive as income. So, so that being able to offset that, do you attribute that to bonus depreciation, Cost segregation, would he be able to have a zero tax income had it not been for those and simply depreciation, 1031 exchanges, et cetera? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if the person qualifies as a real estate professional, then all of that income, right, the, the acquisition fees, et cetera, all of that sort of income, the depreciation will be able to use. I mean, there's a hierarchy. First, it goes to offset the rental income. But then if there's any left over, then yes, it will go to offset any ordinary income whatsoever. Yeah, that makes sense. But in your intuition, let's say if, if, if one is not a real estate professional and if one does not cost segregate, and then it's typically would be harder to actually end up with zero, well, zero income in the event, one is, let's say it's a broker collecting fees or uh, whichever brokerage commissions, et cetera. Yeah. Oh, well, okay, that's not, that, that, that's real estate for, I mean, okay, okay, understood your answer. That's good. Okay, cool. Yeah, I mean, uh, listen, the, 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 the the funny thing is, is that, I mean, with residential, th this is much more beneficial for commercial properties for a couple of reasons. But one thing, one reason is simply because uh, small residential, um, you know, houses, whatever, single families, whatever, typically speaking, the ordinary straight line depreciation deduction is usually enough uh, to offset the income. From that, meaning you may not need cost segregation because you don't have enough income. Typically speaking, for short for short term rentals or other types of commercial properties, income is usually much higher than, uh, and so therefore that's why you are much more proportionate to the ordinary depreciation deduction, which is why you, know, you would, you know, it's more beneficial. Understood. But uh, let's say in a scenario of because you mentioned brokers, for example, you have a broker who is purchasing, let's say, single family homes. Yeah. Uh, and he wants to offset uh, his 1031 exchange. Let's say he, instead of 1031 exchange, he wants to offset his capital gains via, you know, cost segregation, bonus depreciation. So how feasible is it cost-wise to complete, a, you know, this kind of engineering study on a on what would be the minimum property value that it's actually practical to do it? Because it, it's pretty clear it's extremely valuable for like um, large multifamily right. commercial real estate. Um, but what would be like uh, in your mind the threshold, you know, property value for that to be practicable? 
Yeah, typically speaking, I mean, my rule of thumb is generally anything over half a million dollars is pretty much a no brainer. Not to say that anything less than that, you know, won't be beneficial. The cost to get a concentration study done is different. It depends on the, you know, the size of the property, the scope of work, et cetera. But typically speaking, somewhere in the range of about three to six thousand dollars. That's kind of our our general range for most types of properties out there. There are going to be commercial properties, you know, much larger scope of work that are going to be more than that. Um, you know, if you have like a 300,000 square foot shopping mall or something like that, or, you know, uh, 300, you know, 500,000 square foot, you know, office tower, obviously there's a lot more work involved uh, from our engineering's perspective, going into every unit, et cetera. But typically speaking, it's uh, the work involved is going to be less. So the benefits far outweigh, you know, the cost in almost every instance. The only time where I recommend not doing it is where it's so little. I mean, you have a hundred thousand dollar house or something like that. There's not a lot of benefit there, especially if you're not a real estate professional. Um, another thing you did bring up, Stefan, which is, you know, what if you have this 1031 exchange or, or, or excuse me, you had a capital gains. Now capital gains are, there's two different types of capital gains, or a few different types, but the main two I think is really important to distinguish. I did mention it earlier is that capital gain from a sale of a rental property Okay, real estate is considered passive gain. So the passive losses from depreciation can work to offset that as well. Okay, uh, so I know people who maybe they sold the property and they are looking at a big capital gain bill. And so they want to invest in real estate in order to get this depreciation to help to offset that in the current year. However, capital gains from stocks, right, from anything like that, any business sold like that. All that's going to be active is going to be treated active. The depreciation, unless you're a real estate professional, is not going to be able to help that. Okay. So just want to make that clear. Um, Jeff asked the question here, I close the property multi-unit in October. We'll be able to claim bonus for the entire year as a limit of the three months I own the property. Typically speaking, excellent question, Jeff, because typically speaking, depreciation is uh, prorated to the date that you bought the property. So buying them in October, you're only gonna get two or three months of total depreciation. However, and that applies to conservation as well. However, with 100% bonus depreciation, you can actually, since you're taking the entire five year and entire 15 year depreciation up front, you get to take the entire amount. Even if you bought a property on December 31st, you get to take depreciation, uh, the bonus depreciation of that entire amount uh, in this tax year. And the cost of study itself, uh, usually takes us about six to eight weeks or so to complete. It does not need to be done in the tax year. Okay, I get this question all the time. Oh, I need to get this done before December 31st. It doesn't need to be done. As long as you have it before you file your taxes, uh, you're fine. I mean, we're, we're very busy September 15th, right? October 15th time when people are filing extensions because that's the time we need to get the conservation finished. Understood. And to clarify, you guys do the cost segregation studies, study, and then, you know, Whoever like your clients take it to their CPA, etc. You do not, or do you also do like some of the CPA? We do not do any tax uh, tax work whatsoever. We're yep. solely a yep. conservation company. We have a sister company that's a 1031 exchange mm -hmm. intermediary, uh, quad intermediary, but uh, and another sister company, Title Insurance. So we're in the real estate business. We're not in the tax business. Okay, understood. So yeah, thank you for putting all the time, uh, Yona. So do you guys have any last questions, perhaps? Before we wrap up, no. Okay, so so thank you, Yona, for being here today. It was a real pleasure and uh, great value to myself and everybody here. Okay, I'm sure uh, there are more questions. Uh, if you do have them, please feel free to reach out anytime. I think we put my contact info there, and uh, you can find me on LinkedIn. That's literally the best place to connect with me. Yeah. So once again, like this, so the best way LinkedIn. Yeah. So Yona Weiss on LinkedIn. That's it. Any um, any other way you want people should reach to you? Yeah, here I'll put this in. I'll put something here in the chat if anyone wants to. And guys, by the way, you can save the chat. I don't know if you know that. There's a way you click a button, the three dots at the bottom of the chat where it's at. You're right. You just click the three button that says save chat. You get to save the entire chat. But I will put this here, my link tree, and that has everything you want to find for me uh, over there. Awesome. Thank you so much. That was great. Thank you. Thanks Pleasure, Stefan. It's great. Great to see you all.